This is a bit of a tough gig for you as, as well as for me. It's, it's tough for you because you're going to have to listen to me for half an hour. And it's tough for me because I've got to keep you interested in some material that some of which you'll have heard before. And you'll have heard it before from some very exciting people. So following Alison Tedstone, a world nutritionist, to talk about nutrition policy, it's a tough gig. And Kenneth Kalman, I think, always is very interesting, very exciting. My kids are six and three, and none of them have been on Strictly Come Dancing yet, so um, <laughs> I, I really can't compete. Um, what I'll try and do to keep it interesting, so I'm a civil servant, we are currently consulting on a diet and obesity strategy, that consultation is shut, and we are analysing it, so I'm still to take to ministers the, the, the fruits of that analysis, so I'll talk a little bit through some of what you'll have heard a bit of anyway, because, because I must, but I'll maybe do something a bit more interesting at the end, which is reflect a bit about where I think that will take us, and drawing on some experiences I've had in recent times in public health, what I think some of the lessons from my taking minimum unit pricing for alcohol um, all the way through a journey um, through the Supreme Court to implementation on the 1st of May um, of this year, what that might teach us about what might be to come. So that might just keep you going at the end of, of a long day. Um, so that's the consultation document. You probably know that we launched it um, in October. Um, it ran that consultation until the end of January. And what we like to say about that is it, it has a package of bold measures, taking a whole population approach, and it's designed to enable healthier choices, empower personal change, and show some leadership. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about today about how that, that, that cashes out. The document's divided into three chapters, transforming the food environment, living healthier and more active lives, and leadership and what we call exemplary practice. The consultation response is being done at the moment, the analysis of that. So I'll make a few observations, but they are only that, they're just observations. Generally, the consultation responses have been very positive. Um, many are welcoming the bold action, but what you tend to see is that people who work in a public health environment welcome it. People who work at the other end of a spectrum, and I'll come back to why that's not really a fair description in some ways, tend to either welcome it or give it a cautious welcome, or say why it's going to be very difficult indeed. And one of my themes of today will be how do we get under that to get the really the important dialogue that we need. Um, there's lots of things which aren't in the consultation. And again, I'll say a little bit more about that later. So we don't talk much about reformulation. And quite a lot of people come back and say, well, why don't you talk much about reformulation? And the answer is because it's been done very well, and it's been very done very well elsewhere. So for us, this is the strategy about what do we in Scotland need to do, either off our own bat or to supplement what is happening at a UK level. And again, that's, that's significant for reasons that will become clear later. <coughs> we also talk about um, significant in, um, investment into weight management interventions. Now, we tend to say for people at risk of or with type 2 diabetes, and again, one of the emerging themes is people immediately assume that means we're not interested in other types of disease related to overweight, um, or that somehow we've, we've chosen that almost just because it's, 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 it's um, a visible target. It's more complicated than that, but the consultation paper, I don't think, managed to get that across well. So one of the things we'll do is, is we'll, we'll probably talk more about that. I used to work in European policy, back when European policy was straightforward and easy. Um, and I remember being at a very long European meeting, sitting next to a, a very wry and amusing German colleague. And I can't remember how long the meeting had been going on, but it was plenty long enough. And he yawned and he said to me, oh, Daniel, he said, I, he, he was just about to retire. He said, I feel that I'm in yet another meeting where it's all been said, but not everybody has said it yet. <laughs> so there you go. Um, but it bears repeating. 65% of adults in Scotland are overweight or obese. And, and just, it is abnormal to be a healthy weight. So whatever we go on to do to talk about sections of the population or how we talk to people or inequalities, this is all of us. There's nobody, there's no cohort where this doesn't appear. There's none of us for whom this doesn't, 
at least have some resonance somewhere. Um, Alison spoke about the socioeconomic costs. There's different ways of running those numbers. There's a lot of complexity behind how you do it. Um, um, we put some up there in terms of the Scottish numbers. There's a bit more in the consultation paper about that. Let me add just a little bit of a constitutional dimension to it. In the Scottish Government, we are now increasingly responsible for raising the money that is spent in Scotland. So the, the absolute necessity now to attend to um, whether or not our population is well enough to, to be at work, whether or not our population is requiring expensive, unnecessary or preventable medical treatment, whether or not our population can care for its grandchildren so, so its daughters can go out to work. All of these things are just ever further up our agenda. So, so that it's, it's a feature of what I would call fiscal literacy, that this is now not just a public health case. This is a case about how you need to be to run a country. And anybody who listens to the First Minister will occasionally pick up some of that language from her. Um, um, and it's, it's a global phenomenon. We, we know this. So yesterday I um, was at First Minister's side as she was dialing into an international teleconference with the Bloomberg Philanthropies organisation, who identify this as one of their top three things to be attended to in terms of um, looking at how, how the, the public health burden and the burden of disease plays out in a global context. So, so this isn't a higher income country issue, this is a, a, an issue for everybody in the world really at the moment. And in Scotland it's a, a particularly salient issue, because as is so often we feel some of these health inequalities particularly sharply. Um, not on that slide is also something Alison was telling you about, which is also the leading cause of general anaesthesia in children is tooth decay, which ought to shock when you think it's preventable. Why do we go for type 2 diabetes so much? And again, it's, it ought not to be seen as a moral question. There's always an ethical dimension to why we're doing this. We want to keep people well, but, but there's a fundamental thing. It's just hugely prevalent. It's largely, in terms of type 2 diabetes, um, um, something we ought to be able to prevent or delay or to mitigate, if not to, to take away. And the costs are just astronomical. So it's not just that it's well known. It is just simply that if you follow the money, it's very obvious that we need to be doing more and better here as we think about a population. I mean, um, when I first came into the job, I, I, it's... It's just the case that there are, we're over-consuming by at least 10%. There are, um, so, there's so much food down, going down the collective Scottish gullet that we need to take 10% of it out. And even then, beyond that patterning, you have, you know, that's one of Scotland's major cities living with a very, very difficult disease and a disease that progresses way in ways which are deeply difficult for people. So you know all of that, but it bears repeating. And it bears repeating, and we say it in the consultation document, there's lots of dimensions to why a healthy relationship with food and diet are important. I cash it out there in terms of another type of burden of disease, and you'll have probably seen the Cancer Research UK um, 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 campaign at the moment, which is talking about um, the links between diet and obesity and overweight and diabetes. Um, um, but we should see the positives as well, and I'll say a bit about that in a moment. But the burden of disease is so great, we can't fail to act. <coughs> Another thing that I think is clear from the consultation responses is that our relatively narrow language around health inequalities means that people think we fail to take sufficient account of that. I don't think that's right behind the scenes, but it's clearly how, when we communicated, people reacted to it. Don't try and understand that slide unless you're really an expert, but that, that slide shows you a couple of things. So um, it's a slide with a positive and a negative in it. Now, the positive is that there is a cohort of people for whom we are actually seeing um, um, obesity in primary one children coming down. Are they the wealthy or are they the poor kids? The, the wealthy kids. Great news. Great news if you're a wealthy kid, but great news also because it tells you that this issue that we have with obesity, it's not insurmountable. 
if people have the right tools, if they feel that they have the right control over their lives, if we can get the offer right for them, um, something can be done about the problem that we have. So, you know, the obesity epidemic, the crisis, etc. It's, it's achievable to see change, but there's a negative in this slide as well, and it's one that's familiar to anybody who works in public health, which is that, firstly, as too often is the case, the poor bear the, bur the, poor bear the burdens of this problem disproportionately, both in terms of prevalence, which is the amount of obesity that which this slide is showing, um, but also quite often in terms of harms. Now, I'll jump ahead a bit. In alcohol, what we know is that on relatively similar consumption patterns at the level of quintiles, mortality is eight, um, is eight times higher in the poorest part of the population. So your ability to withstand the burdens of these diseases is so much worse in terms of alcohol. I don't yet know what, it will, what we'll find around obesity, but it makes sense that if you're struggling with diabetes, if you're struggling in later life, you're more likely to be in the sorts of jobs where you're less likely to have the sort of employer who can make the adjustments required. So we need to be very careful not to think that the inequality sh challenge is central here. The other thing we know about public health is too often too many of our responses are taken up by the middle class kids or the middle class that eat more easily than those for whom the burden is actually highest. So we need to be thoughtful as we take this forward about how we design public health interventions that have an absolute impact, but also a relative impact in inequalities terms. Here's a relatively complex slide, which just shows us, I think something that's now a complete commonplace, that if we wait for the current system or personal responsibilities to sort this out for us, it won't work. Um, um, there's just too much evidence from all around the world that, and we've run the experiment in Scotland. If you leave us with roughly the food environment we have, 65% of us end up overweight or obese. And either you can say 65% of us are somehow failing the test of personal responsibility, or more critically, what you say at a population health level is something is wrong with a system that produces that result. So. Um, I don't want to take you through all of that. You were taken through it by more interesting people than me earlier today, I'm sure. But what that means is we have to be into the business of transforming the food environment. <coughs> I won't read all of those, but I think probably the most interesting thing in some ways, which is in our consultation document, reflects a mood, certainly in the parliament, certainly in the government, certainly in the health and sport committee which when they looked at this issue said if you don't be brave if you're not brave about this we will consider our own committee bill so that's that's a big thing um, if you can't do things to transform the food environment you won't succeed here and we know this from food standards scotland we know this from the most clear and independent research the second data behind all of this as well um, if we don't change the food environment we won't see what we need to succeed to succeed so the consultation document talks about tackling promotions. <coughs> that's a big moment because that takes us straight into um, the moment where retail and industry and manufacturing and the things that we care deeply about also operate. So we don't go there lightly and I'll say, well, that's what I'll conclude with. We talk about the marketing and advertising of high fat salt sugar foods. Um, we talk as others have had about the out-of-home offerings and how important they are and what we might be able to do here. Um, and we also talk about making sure that as we look to accelerate a change that I think is coming anyway. So you heard from Greg's and for all of the concern that Iron Brew found themselves forced to change their formula or however you want to paraphrase it, consumer demand has been changing in that market for years anyway. So it's already at a tipping point between no sugar and full sugar drinks. So, so there's something about how quickly can you accelerate something that's already in consumer minds anyway. Um, and I am not expressing a view on the iron brew position. <laughs> um, um, so as part of the new strategy as well, we've announced that we will provide some money to small and medium enterprise who, uh, who make up so much of the Scottish food and drink sector to help them think about reformulation. Alison got asked a very interesting question earlier about 
are there any examples of reformulation unlocking actual um, um, profit? To which the answer is yes, absolutely. We know lots of it. Um, um, the health category is something that when we speak to the Food and Drink Federation and other bodies, they're extremely interested in. And of course, what they, they see it both in terms of their ability to talk to the consumer about health, but of course, as a way of driving sales and growth and a way of adding value into a product. Um, and sometimes you can unlock that in unexpected ways. I'll be careful because I won't use the name, but I think I know. Um, we, we provide some funding. As part of it, you have to show that there's a, um, for reformulation, and as part of it, you have to show that there's a health dimension to the reformulation you're achieving. So usually it's just about driving growth. So one decently large, but large butchers in Scotland thought, well, in order to get through that way, and I'm, you know, um, um, we'll provide a healthier, slimmer's burger. It became one of our best-selling ranges. So, you know, it's, you know, it can drive real product innovation. So you can find a real premium in health. And when you go to industry, they talk about this. Um, I'll see if Ewan's nodding or not at this point, but there you go. Other things in the strategy, I'll probably just say a bit less about them um, at the moment. Living healthier and more active lives. Um, it's important that we talk about active travel and physical activity, not because, you can, not because we believe that you can rebalance your diet or your energy intake that way, but there are lots of physical and mental benefits to exercise in any case. So it is a good thing. It's part of the, the balance but it's never going to be sufficient. And again, another public health truth here, which is true of the alcohol policy as well, no one thing on its own will ever work. You need a package of measures. You're talking about a complex environment. Um, um, a big thing there about investing in people who are already on the path. Now, a lot of people want to say of that 42 million pounds, well, how preventative is, how preventative is that really? It's, it's a pretty good bet, and I always go back to tobacco, which I work on as well. I want to say about tobacco that it's best that people never start. And when my six-year-old son asked me how many cigarettes he should smoke, he doesn't do that yet. I would say to him, none, or possibly one. Just, you know, don't, don't be too constrained, son. Um, um, but none, ideally. Um, um, but once you get into the business of a population where it's already endemic, there's no way actually of breaking the cycle without thinking that your best investment, not the only thing you should do, but your best investment is around cessation and cessation services for people who have already started. So it's just, it's a sums thing. Um, leadership and exemplary practice. I was really interested in the Greg's thing about how they talk to their staff. Some of the large retailers have really excellent programs about staff well-being, And I sometimes worry that within, um, both the health service and in social care, that wider, that wider world, we are probably not as good at speaking to our staff about their health and well-being and supporting them as I would like. And probably when we do, they slightly suspect we're only doing it because of absenteeism or they feel that that's a bit of a challenge to them. So again, there's something about language and how we talk to people there. But I'd like to think that we get better just across the public sector. Um, there's, there's real achievements today, but you can, you can read the strategy for them. Um, I've said some of that before, um, but let me, let me say a few things then just about minimum pricing and, and where I think that might take us. So my observations about the strategy generally, talking about diet, weight and disease is highly sensitive both to individuals and politically. As we speak about the issue of overweight, there's going to be many people for whom that's completely misses a primary concern, whether or not for them it's about eating disorders or underweight. At population health terms, I think we're on to the right thing, but my ministers, I, everybody who's in this field needs to be really careful with the language and to make sure that we don't, we don't accidentally send messages of exclusion. Um, finding the positives is really important as well. I wouldn't talk to a friend about their weight in a way which was, I hope, castigating. I would want to work out what they were wanting to do and what they were wanting to achieve and try and work with them that way. So as we, as a government, talk about that, I think we, we need to be careful about the, the burden of disease and the fiscal need driving a debate that sounds censorious or says, well, if you don't do that, you're letting the rest of society down. It's not, 
not how we should be. It's not, that's not what public health should be about for me. Um, second, I think, the second observation is just that one about there's not been much purchase yet on the detail in the consultation paper. There's quite a lot of consultation responses that, to my mind, say we really like anything that is public health and aimed at constraining food consumption. And there's quite a lot that I might slightly sceptically read as saying, we really like the idea of this, but none of these ideas quite work for us, so could you go away and come up with some other ones? Um, and then there's quite a lot that's, that's just positive, but, but a lot of positional stuff and not a lot of contact with some of the details. So we're going to need to expand that out in future discussions. Um, and on that last issue, that's where I think I see a bit of an, an analogy with minimum pricing for alcohol and some learning that I hope to take into the, the process to come. Right, I'll be very careful here. I don't see minimum pricing for alcohol as the same as thinking about restrictions in marketing around food, different types of commodity. Um, but there are some things which are extremely similar. Firstly, I see in the Parliament and I see in my ministers a real willingness to take action. Um, but I also see the fact that if you end up in litigation, which is always a possibility, you need to have shown that you did what you did because you were led by the evidence and that you were being proportionate. So whatever we do next has to have that fundamentally through the heart of it, which is why the evidence base really matters. Public support is extremely important. We need that, but so do we, but so do we also need an evidence base. Um, we mustn't think, I think, of industry as monolithic. So minimum unit pricing was not opposed by the industry. Parts of industry, parts of retail were very supportive of minimum pricing um, and parts were against it. Parts took us to court. Um, and, and why does that matter? Um, I think it matters because in order to design a successful public health policy, we need really quality engagement with people in retail, industry, manufacturing for lots of reasons. Number one, there are a lot of decently paid jobs out there in those industries. That is one of the best public health interventions I have. So I do not want to do something that interferes in a market that could impact on jobs um, without thinking very carefully about why that's being done. Um, um, secondly, these guys understand their customers brilliantly, much better than I ever could, and on the basis of data that we could never have, I suspect, in many cases. So if I can work with... Um, people who are feeding the population, with supermarkets, with Greggs, with Subways, with you know, whoever it is, um, I am much more likely to understand how the consumer is likely to respond if they're able to talk to me honestly and openly. Um, um, and that means, I think, that there's a real onus both in how my team approaches this consultation and the discussions to come, but also on those parts of industry who want to work with us and respond to it, to really be led by the evidence. I found there were moments in minimum pricing for alcohol where I had great conversations with industry representatives about the effects our policy might have, things that they would like us to see, to adjust that, to respond to it, to design a policy that was minimally disruptive for them. And that was critical to me, both because it's a better way of making policy, but secondly, the court would need to see that we had taken this into account. Um, but there were other moments as well when I saw the industry question the evidence or bypass it in ways which I didn't think were acting in fully good faith. Now, it doesn't really matter much what I think, but those moments were far less helpful. They created a much more difficult tension, and they risked creating as well, I think, a public perception that there was a monolithic drinks industry out there, which is entirely unfair. It's a complex industry with lots of legitimate um, reasons to think that it might want to engage in arguments about whether or not a policy works or not. So I don't, I don't stand in the way of that. But, but I think the evidence is absolutely critical. And I think when we get closer to it, the more that we talk honestly about the likely impacts, the more likely we are to design the policies um, that I hope would um, succeed. Um, <coughs> so... I'll conclude there, really. I think what I see in the Scottish Parliament at the moment and what I see in ministers is a will to see significant action. Um, 
but a keen awareness from us that any such action is to be supported by that careful collection of the evidence and a sense that whatever we suggest needs to be brave and bold, but it needs to pass that test of proportionality. And experts will understand that that's the language of the court there. Um, um, thanks very much to FSS, both for inviting me here to, to, um, to the graveyard shift, Elspeth, but also, um, but also to have been a source of independent advice and a building of that evidence base in a way that I think we can use, we can help to inform the discussion with ministers to come. So thank you very much. Thanks, Daniel. I think that was a, a, a great insight for us that really drilled underneath the, um, the content of the obesity uh, strategy and the consultation and, and, and shows, I think, how you, are, you and your team are, are thinking very deeply about what will need to be done to bring it to life and, and how you need to go about doing those things. And also, I think critically, um, the importance of, of learning the lessons from minimum unit pricing whilst recognising that the solutions here are, are, are indeed uh, likely to be different. Um, a couple of questions have come through on the app. There may be some in person. Uh, but whilst people... Th oh, yes, we've got one right at the front. Do you want me to go first or you want to take... Um, far away. <laughs> Yeah, that was really helpful. I was very struck by your graph of the <coughs> divergence between the bottom and top quintiles in this, in this century. And I just wonder if you think that the measures you're proposing in the consultation document, which ones of those will start bending the graph for people in the bottom quintile? Or do you think there's other wider government measures which will have more impact on that? Things which affect the environment equally for everybody um, are more likely to have an absolute benefit without that widening. So that's why I think things which affect the food environment are really important. Again, there's an analogy there with minimum pricing. So minimum pricing will be most effective because it falls equally everywhere, but the harm falls most in those communities which are most deprived. So, so opponents of that would say, well, that's regressive. But actually, what's regressive is the patterns of harm to start with. So I think all society measures are extremely important when you're talking about legislation. In terms of how you frame services, anything you can do to get it into those parts of a population where the harm exists is going to actually be better off in equalities terms. So I like the football fans and training programs. I like things like that because they tend to be in non-standard um, 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 settings. Um, <laughs> um, Always at the bottom of the handbag, um, isn't it? But it's, <laughs> it's a challenge because what we know are things like campaigns can widen that gap. We've done things around the smoking cessation, which again, your smoking prevalence rates are four times <coughs> higher in the poorest communities in Scotland. We have an LDP standard that attempts to skew service delivery into settings which are more likely to be um, de delivered in those parts of, of Scotland. But even there, it's so complex because anybody who knows about multiple deprivation, as I'm sure you do, knows a lot of the poorest people in Scotland live in some of the areas of least deprivation. So, so we have to keep at it, but we have to keep measuring it and we have to keep seeing what effects we're having. So I think the most likely Im impacts there are around advertising, marketing, promotions are most likely to have those impacts. The out-of-home <coughs> offer would be interesting as well. That's why I'd be really interested in working with Greg's, for example. I suspect they are feeding those parts of the population we're often concerned with. Okay, if I take a question from the screen, how quickly will or can the measures in the government's diet and obesity strategy be implemented? <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Well, we got from a standing start to implementation of minimum <laughs> unit pricing in just under a decade. Mm. <laughs> um, that, I don't think, is typical. Um, it depends... Uh, it depends where we go with this. So the weight management stuff is quite easy to do something on quite quickly. And you could grow that quickly if we, if we manage to get the investment right. So money really helps things. Um, some of the potential action around advertising and marketing could be done relatively swiftly. But again, a lot depends on what's the response of those who, who might not see its merit. Um, um, NHS leadership. 
I'm hopeful that can be done quickly, but that's going to take some hard yards. It's difficult stuff. So um, we have the great merit, though, of um, we're starting from a, a pretty low base. I think there's a lot we can do and a lot quite quickly. Um, and in some ways, my job is very complex, but in some ways, it is the simple job of you don't, it's not that much reduction in calorie intake that we really need at an individual basis or even at a population level to make progress. So, so I'm hopeful. We've got a question at the back of the hall. Can I just pick up again on the uh, issue of the divergence between the well-off and the less well-off? Uh, we heard this morning about how Brexit is going to make pr food prices go up, most likely. But if you follow the logical argument about the obesity strategy anywhere, effectively we've got to take calories out of the food chain, out of the diet. Now that means if we've got to sell less, basically, because people are going to consume less, that's going to put pressure on the food industry probably to put, put prices up and make food more costly. So uh, how are we going to deal with this issue of actually make, if we end up making f food more costly, actually not making the situation for the less well off worse than it currently is? It's a good question. I'll take one issue with the way you phrase it, which is we don't have to sell less, we have to consume less. So the value of the sale could be the same for all I care about in a public health perspective. Um, as long as the consumption goes down. And all I really mean by that is you can move up the value chain in some ways. Um, and you see an example of that, again, in minimum pricing, I'll go to is um, what happens is actually you get, um, you, get in, you get fall in consumption and the health benefits, but the actual retail value to the industry we project goes up. So, you know... That does bring potentially a burden onto poorer families, though. So we really need to think about the cost of food. And it's one of the reasons to work with the industry mm -hmm. is you've got to work through how that works. Something in our favour here, though, is remember what I said. Most, mostly the problem in Scotland is that people are over-consuming. So what I would say to somebody who's over-consuming by, and if you take the population as a whole, 10%, and struggling with money, that's really difficult, really difficult, is nonetheless, if you can find a way of reducing your consumption by 10%, that's at least a saving. You should want that for your own health, and it's not actually going to cost you more. So what we're trying to do is take some cost out, but I accept that it's a complex environment. Question here. Anne Anderson, University of Dundee. Thank you for a nice presentation. Um, of course, we're all concerned about advertising and marketing, but what about availability? Um, of energy dense foods and um, the healthcare retail um, standard which has recently been in implemented has covered both promotions and the availability of healthy versus less healthy food trying to aim for a level playing field so there's obviously an opportunity there we've seen implementation we've seen it being rolled out are there plans to roll that out beyond the NHS so it's there are some private sector retailers who have looked to achieve a healthy re retail standard, a healthcare retail standard. So, but not, we, we're not proposing at the moment a plan to take that into a requirement, for example, in the private sector. So um, what is the government thinking around availability of these foods? Um, it's not a big part of this strategy. And I think there is a sense of you have to work at the, the point at which your population can move, and we have to be honest about that. So... Availability is a very live issue now around alcohol provision, for example, and even there it's very tough, where the absolute necessity for the commodity is not, is not there, but there is a legitimate market for it. So, so it's a tough one. And, and at the moment, does our strategy say we're going to roll this out? And no. So you're shirking a tough issue? No. No, it's a tough issue. It's not in the current consultation document, but it's something you could talk to ministers about, but it's not for me to, to just simply say uh, it looks like a good idea or not. It's that's something that has to be through a parliament. There's some questions coming up through the app, but I think we've got one, another one at the top of the room again. Mm. 
You were mentioning in your talk that evidence is absolutely important when kind of you want to be at the front of kind of changes in public health. And as you are so kind of progressive in a way, perhaps compared to other countries, what kind of evidence do you need? Because not all the evidence you need in order to kind of make this happen may be there. So you need a convincing theory of change. You need some convincing modeling that shows that you've given attention to what you can know and what you can't know about the likely impacts of your policy. And you need to show that you've thought about that in a broad context. So not simply in, you know, were I to remove X from this and everybody were then to just respond in a very blank way, would we achieve a public health benefit? Is that sufficient? You need to think about your impact on wider society and markets and trade and all of those things. So, so that's the sort of, it's, it's not always evidence based on empirical data from what's already happened. It can be modeling. So that's one of the lessons. There's no evidence for minimum pricing in exactly the way we've designed it. There is a convincing case in the eyes of the court. So, so that's what I mean. It's, it's, it's a tough one sometimes. So you need to balance that ability to win an argument, and not an argument in a sort of rhetorical way, with the public willingness and the parliamentary willingness to take you into permission to act. That's a very civil service answer. <laughs> There's a couple of questions up here, Daniel, which start to touch on um, children and interventions in relation to younger people. So I think the first of those is, is there any interest in including in the strategy uh, any educational programmes focused on the the younger population, and that's qualified by being under 16. And then I suppose a, a sort of development from that, uh, thinking again about the next phase of what the UK government might, um, uh, might come forward with in the next steps of its childhood obesity plan, uh, what would you like to be in that? And do you think the focus should be wider than just children? Okay. Let me start with the middle one. So. The team who lead on diet and obesity is headed up by Mel Weldon, and she will currently be thinking in quite some detail about what we say around educational programs. This consultation document itself, one of the, the interesting things about the graph I showed you is school-aged children is a particular cohort we've, we've not done too badly on, and actually school meals are a relatively controlled environment. Now, I'm keenly aware there'll be lots of people with very strong views about that, but at least there's nutritional standards and at least we know what they are and whether or not they're met. Um, so within that controlled environment, I think we're doing okay. Um, but we also know that education is important, but it itself won't solve the problem. So we need to go to the environment. So there's lots we must do and continue to do and do do on education. Um, Mel would speak to much greater detail on it than I am, but, but it's an important part of our strategy. It's just not what's going to change. Mm -hmm. I think we need to keep at that and it needs to be, to be more. At population level, though, it's the environment as well that matters. <coughs> and what they eat out of school, which is so tough to control. Um, what would I like to see in the UK government's childhood obesity plan too? I mean, is, is this one for ministers really? Well, I think the soft drinks levy is a proof of concept of change. So I was very pleased by the fact <coughs> now that wasn't technically in the UK childhood obesity one, it was, in the, it was in the budget. That was a real step forward though. I think those sorts of all society environmental <coughs> measures are absolutely critical. Reformulation, I'd like to see them gather the fruits of all the hard work that they've been doing with you guys on yeah. reformulation, because we will gather them in Scotland, because that is a UK-wide program. Mm -hmm. So I am very happy about that. Personally, I would tend to wonder what the work of the word childhood is in that plan, because obesity isn't a feature of childhood. In fact, it's probably at its least prevalent in childhood. Mm -hmm. Obesity is something, or sorry, overweight is something that is progressive. Children eat the same food as their yeah. families. So the focus on childhood, I think, is one that politically we've not gone to in Scotland, yeah. and I think probably that's a strength. Yeah. Mm, final questions. There's one little left with us <coughs> on the screen. Um, Alcohol isn't an essential, i.e. we don't need it to live, but food is. So how far do you think we can take the, the minimum unit pricing analogy? How far can that be extended? Oh, I, I think I took it a bit further than 
that then maybe I would do again. But it's, I think the analogy is around that need for proportionality in response and that need for quality engagement with those people who might not immediately think that the, the policy is to be embraced. So that's where the analogy is. I think there are hugely significant differences beyond that point. But, but remember, alcohol is for many people a part of their diet as well. So, you know, it's, it's not an, an analogy I claim that is perfect or lasts, lasts much beyond this, this, this auditorium. There's no further questions for Daniel. I would just like him, like to thank him for uh, his talk and for taking these quite difficult questions, quite challenging questions, and um, pu pu having to put himself some po uh, at some point uh, where where he might really expect his minister to be answering some of these points. <laughs> so, thank you, Daniel. It was very helpful. Thank you.